Great. Thank you so much for this invitation to be here. It's um, this series topic of sort of methods and application and that interface is right where a lot of my own interests are. So I'm really happy to be talking with you all. Um, and I'm sorry, we're not, I'm not in Sweden right now, but <laughs> it's again, nice to be with all of you and from all around the world, it sounds like. So welcome. Um, so yeah, as Anthony just referenced, this work is going to be, um, in some ways, it's it's new-ish work. Let me confess, this is, I think, the second time I've given a talk on this general topic. And so, you know, you'll, you'll be seeing very much work in progress. And I will say up front, we don't have magic answers uh, <laughs> to this question in the title. In fact, in some ways, the work has been raising more questions and challenges than, than answers. But it really um, did sort of grow out of my previous work, partly in non-experimental study methods, and then in randomized trials and sort of how do we think about the generalizability of randomized trials. Um, and what we're trying to do here is to sort of bring together these different data sources to understand treatment effect heterogeneity. So um, let me proceed um, and sort of explain. But again, un unfortunately, in some ways, uh, there may, may be more questions than answers by the end. I uh, really want to acknowledge this uh, great team that has worked on this project. In particular, I put Carly Lupton Brantner's name in bold because she's really the student, a PhD student who's been leading a lot of this work. Um, another PhD student, Leon Stefano, is, is working on some variations on this that have a more Bayesian feel. Um, and then a great set of collaborators at Duke and here at Hopkins and funding from the National Institute of Mental Health and PCORI, which is another funding agency here in the US. Um, and then also reference and thanks to data access um, through a, a source called Vivly for the randomized trials. And then we'll see um, Duke and Hopkins for some EHR data. Okay, so what are we talking about here? You know, I think in a lot of medicine and public health and I also straddle education and sort of, I feel like in so many of these areas, there's really this sort of, calling the holy grail, this desire of figuring out like what works for whom. Um, can we do personalized public health, personalized medicine, where we are trying to understand sort of do the effects of different treatments or interventions differ for different sorts of people? And can we use that to inform treatment decisions? You know, again, this, this ideal where, oh, we know that this medication is going to be particularly beneficial for you and not you. And so we're going to kind of target that to the people that will get the most benefit. Um, so this is again sort of great. And I will say that like the National Institute of Mental Health in the US, any randomized trial of um, services for mental health, they are required to do this sort of effect heterogeneity, examin heterogeneity examination. Um, so again, there's a lot of interest. I also, the second bullet there, just to be clear, there's also a lot of names for this. So I will sort of interchangeably use the words treatment effect heterogeneity, modification or moderation, all for this idea that the treatment effects might vary across different people or settings. So what is the sort of challenge here and that really what motivated this work is that individual studies, at least the way we do them now, can really only help so much. So randomized trials, of course, are incredibly useful for providing unbiased treatment effect estimates. And often in a randomized trial, people might look at subgroup effects. They might see, do the effects vary for people with different comorbidities or across different age ranges? But a real problem with randomized trials in this, for this goal is that these trials are almost never statistically powered for to look at subgroup effects. Um, you know, in my experience, often the trials are powered to just barely detect a sort of an overall average main effect. And there's this sort of general, very rough rule of thumb that to look at e a subgroup effect, even for just two groups, like older and younger, you need four times the sample size to be able to know if those effects really do differ across age. So randomized trials give us unbiasedness, but are very small and generally underpowered for effect heterogeneity. So then we also think, well, we also have large scale data where we might be able to use non-experimental studies that might have the benefit of reflecting kind of real world use, sort of the use of medications or treatments in practice. They might have more representative populations, but they 
are going to suffer, potentially suffer from confounding, where the people who are receiving some medication or treatment might differ from those who aren't. So this is where there's a huge burgeoning field of trying to combine these data sources and again sort of use kind of benefit from the unbiasedness of a randomized trial with the large size and potential representativeness of say electronic health records or other large cohort studies. I will say this is a bit this work was funded about 18 months ago and I feel like even in that since then uh, the methods work is just exploding in this area. And there's lots of different names for it. So things like data fusion, data integration, hybrid designs. It relates to individual patient data meta-analysis. Um, I tend to think of it as sort of data integration, sort of this idea of integrating different data sources and, and study designs. Um, but again, you might hear all these different terms um, and it's sort of broadly. Um, and again, I'm, I'm going to give sort of an overview of some of the methods today, um, but really it's a very active research area. Um, and I will fully confess that, again, the, the goal here is to eventually bring in the uh, trials and the EHR, but so far what we've been doing and what I'll focus on today is methods to combine multiple randomized trials. So I'll, I'll sort of signal some of these additional connections, but for now, most of what I'll talk about will actually be mostly just how do we think about taking advantage of multiple randomized trials to increase sample size um, to study these sorts of things. Um, and actually, in one, the final bullet there, we, I'm going to be mostly today talking about some machine learning methods, a little bit on some parametric models. And one of that is, again, one of these areas that is just burgeoning in terms of research. And one of the main benefits of these methods, which we'll see, is that the machine learning methods essentially allow a lot of flexibility. So traditional, say, subgroup analyses in randomized trials have required people to specify, you know, we're going to look at age, and we're going to look at older and younger age, or we're going to look at people with this particular comorbidity and without. So very pre-specified based on like a single variable. In some of these contexts, we're interested in almost more of a sort of hypothesis generating kind of idea where we kind of just want to understand do the effects vary across potentially a, a larger number of variables and maybe where we allow for some interactions and other uh, different relationships between those variables. So that's sort of the, the angle we're taking today and I'll come back to that as we go along. Okay, so I wanna motivate this using um, an example from medication for depression treatment. So in particular, we're going to be comparing two medications, and I apologize, some of you um, may be psychiatrists and psychologists with a lot more expertise in this particular topic, so uh, I hope that I don't say anything vastly wrong. Um, but there's there, what we're looking at here are two not common but sort of newer medications for uh, major depressive disorder, especially for people with um, long-term major depressive disorder, people for whom maybe first-line treatments have not been effective. And in particular, it's this duloxetine and vortioxetine. Um, and vortioxetine in particular came on the market relatively, relatively recently. Um, and there's an interest in sort of comparative effectiveness of whether these two medications are differentially effective for individuals. So just as a little bit um, more context here, um, for those of you who are less familiar with this mental health depression context, it's about 30 to 40% of people, um, again, as, as I was just alluding to, there's sort of some first line treatments, sort of common SSRIs, like you might've heard of Prozac, Zoloft, et cetera. But about 30 to 40% of people with major depressive disorder go into remission after the initial treatment with those. So again, then there are these two medications on the market, duloxetine and vortioxetine, that have different mechanisms of action, um, and but are both potentially used for these cases where someone needs a follow-up therapy. There are some um, side effects for both medications. Um, and what's interesting is that there have been randomized trials of both of these sort of clearly to get approved. Um, but most of the time those trials have been reporting comparison of each of those medications with placebo. Um, and so, and, and have shown that both are effective compared to placebo. What we're interested in here is directly comparing vortioxetine with duloxetine um, using a combination of data sets. So just a little bit more on the data that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we have data from four randomized trials. They each had about four or 500 people in them. 
um, where actually all of them had a three-way randomization between duloxetine, vortioxetine, and placebo. Um, again, the primary papers on these trials were mostly comparing the two active treatments with placebo. We are going to be using them to compare duloxetine to, to vortioxetine. Um, the eligibility criteria were for fairly standard for these sorts of studies. Um, there was an age restrictions. They had to have a major depressive episode as a primary diagnosis. And then there was sort of a threshold of a depression rating scale that the participants had to be within. Um, our outcome is going to be, well, we'll look at a few outcomes, but the primary outcome is a change in this depression rating scale from baseline to the end of follow-up. Um, and just for reference, a positive, oh, I haven't introduced what the Kate is, but a positive effect is going to imply that duloxetine is more effective um, than vortioxetine. So here is just a table of some basic descriptives of the people in these trials. So, you know, age 40, mid 40s, predominantly female, um, many had smoked. We don't see huge differences across the, the characteristics in these trials, although a little bit here and there, for example, on the um, anxiety, whether they've co-occurring anxiety is much lower in that third trial. So again, what the goal here is that each of these individual, individual trials is only has four, you know, 600 people in it. And so each of them might not really be powered to be able to tell whether these medications are more effective, say, for older people or females than males or people with anxiety or without anxiety. So what we're interested in here is if we combine across these four trials to increase our sample size, but do so in a smart way where we're kind of addressing the fact that these are four different trials with similar but somewhat different populations, can we better learn about any effect heterogeneity that does exist? Okay, so let me turn to some of the methods. And again, this is a, a rapidly growing area. So I'm kind of just giving a flavor uh, for them today. A little bit of notation. So we're gonna use A to denote treatment status. We have a set of covariates X. Um, here it's labeled continuous. They don't have to be continuous. Again, for now, we'll think of Y um, as a continuous outcome, although it doesn't have to be continuous here, just for sort of notational simplicity, we'll think of it as continuous. And um, hopefully, given this seminar series, you're familiar with potential outcomes and causal inference, but we conceptualize each person as having potential outcome under control and under treatment, Y0 and Y1. And jumping to the bottom, what we're interested in for now is what we'll call the study-specific conditional average treatment effect. So um, that tau, tau of x basically is this function or kind of a, yeah, essentially a function that models the potential outcomes or the difference in potential outcomes as a function of those x's. So we're not interested in just the overall average effect across everyone. We want to know, does that effect vary across levels of x, our baseline characteristics? Um, eventually, we would use a propensity score to address for non-randomized studies. Uh, we don't have that quite yet. Um, and again, we'll have some indicator S for study. And in this case, again, we have four studies. Um, briefly, and I'm just going to briefly cover these assumptions. Partly, each of the methods has like a little bit of nuance in terms of exactly what is assumed or required. Some are more parametric than others. But these are sort of the fairly standard kind of core causal assumptions in a sense. Um, so hopefully some of these are again familiar to many of you. First is the stable unit treatment value assumption often um, known as sort of similar to consistency language in epidemiology where we basically are assuming that those potential outcomes are well-defined in each study. So the treatment is well-defined. Each person has a Y0 and a Y1 in that study. Um, that would be observed. Um, that implicit in that is that one individual's outcomes are not affected by someone else's treatment. That seems very plausible here, um, given the medications and the, the samples of people in these studies. The second assumption is unconfoundedness of each randomized trial that in this case we know is satisfied or we will trust was satisfied because we actually do have randomization. So the potential outcomes are independent of uh, the treatment given the covariates X. And again, this, this is fine here. If we do bring in EHR data, uh, we would have to 
make that assumption about the EHR, the treatment assignments in the non-experimental EHR data. Um, oh, here, sorry, I've actually kind of bundled consistent. I've put consistency here separately. So again, consistency is basically that the outcome we observe is the potential outcome under that person's treatment assignment. So um, kind of just saying that, yes, if we if someone's in the treatment group, we see their outcome under, under treatment. And if someone's in the control group, we see their outcome under control. This next one is a... Um, or sorry, the next one is also fairly standard and is fine in this randomized trial, which is that in every study, every individual or all combinations of X have a non-zero probability of being treated or controlled. That sort of everyone in this study, in these studies, is eligible to receive treatment or control. Um, that again, in a randomized trial, is satisfied because we randomize, we enroll, and then we randomize. This would not be satisfied if there were a group of people that were just ineligible for one of the treatments. Um, and in that case, we just can't learn about these effects for them. The bottom one is the one that's a little bit um, new for multiple studies. And this is basically that we sort of have to assume, this can be relaxed depending on the exact estimate, but in general, we're sort of assuming that there's, that part of each person or each combination of the covariance to be specific could be in any study, so that we have sort of overlap in the study populations. Um, again, this could be relaxed to be a little bit more nuanced, but in general, we're going to assume essentially that there is sort of this general comparability of these populations. They might not look exactly the same, but it's not that one study excluded everyone over the age of 50 or something like that. So it's sort of this study, uh, positivity of study membership is what it's called. Okay, so let me talk now about the methods that have been proposed and that we are examining here um, to do this kind of comparing. And I'm gonna sort of separate them into two pieces. First is what I'll call the single study methods. So these are the methods used in a single study to um, examine treatment effect heterogeneity, to estimate these Kate models, but sort of just within each study. Separate, then we have aggregation methods. So we kind of use single study methods to estimate the effects within studies. And then we have these different approaches to aggregate those across studies. So I'll talk through um, these in a second. So again, this is, a, this is where like the world is changing probably you know, every week. <laughs> so I'm gonna mention three particular approaches for estimating these Kate models. Um, there's a little bit of a just um, terminology thing in this field which is that essentially for all of the, for, well, for two of them, essentially we're modeling the outcome as a function of covariates. And then we use that to estimate the difference in potential outcomes. And there's sort of two ways this is done. And they, uh, this is from a console paper, um, they're labeled S learner and X learner. I'm not totally sure where the names came from, but the S learner basically says, we're gonna fit a model a joint model, we're gonna use all of our data together and we'll fit a joint model of the outcome as a function of the covariates and the treatment assignment. And in again, in this case, we're using sort of flexible non-parametric methods. So there might be interactions that are identified between the covariates and that treatment A, but it's sort of done as one combined joint model. The X learner sort of takes that to an extreme in a sense and estimates separate models. So it says, I'm gonna estimate one model of the potential outcome under treatment using the treatment group data. And I'm gonna estimate a separate model of the potential outcome under control using the control group data, get predicted values from those and then combine. So in a parametric world, these S learner and X learner sort of can be the, seen as kind of complementary, where or sort of, essentially the X learner is like an S learner with all of the interaction terms. In a machine learning context, it's a little bit less of a clear kind of connection, but this sort of operationally is the distinction of how it's done. Um, the third approach is um, from Susan Athey and, and Stefan Wagner and colleagues uses a causal forest basically to more directly model the treatment effect heterogeneity. So it's using rather than sort of modeling the potential outcomes or the effects, the causal forest sort of uses an algorithm that explicitly partitions the covariates based on treatment effect heterogeneity. So it is explicitly finding sort of the splits in the data based on the covariates that lead to treatment effect heterogeneity. So it's a little bit of a more um, 
targeted approach for that. Hopefully that makes some sense. Oops, sorry. Um, okay, so then I'm gonna distinguish a couple different ways. So now imagine that we have used these single study methods in each of our trials. And now we wanna combine them because we, again, we wanna sort of benefit from having multiple studies. So one of the approaches that's done actually not surprisingly, we'll see this doesn't work very well, but one thing is sometimes people will just pool all the data together. So they'll just say, okay, we have 1600 people and we're just going to pool it all together and we're going to run some of those single study approaches. A second sort of basic approach is to pool the data together, but at least keep in an indicator for study. So basically we treat study, like the study indicator basically as a covariate. Um, so we're kind of accounting for the fact that there are four trials, um, but not in a super explicit way. And those indicators, by the way, may or may not get picked up by, say, the machine learning tools in terms of being um, related to the effect heterogeneity. Then um, there's sort of a more complicated approach. And this one, um, if some of you know this term federated learning, this is a really useful approach when um, the individual level data can't actually be shared. So in our case, we do have the individual level data from each study, but in some cases, the individual studies might keep their own data, um, but we wanna sort of combine the results in different ways. So that's called federated learning, where the, uh, what happens with federated learning, it's a little hard to explain, but um, you basically fit a Kate model in each study. So we use those single study approaches in each study. We then sort of use the results of that study to predict the CAPE, these conditional average treatment effects for each person in those studies. So for the 400 people in study one, we will have four sort of estimated conditional average treatment effects, one from each of the models from the four trials. We then share those. So we don't share the individual data itself, but we share the Kate model. So we'll share sort of the N by K Kate estimates in this quote augmented data set. We then fit a model like a machine learning model or something on the augmented data where we're modeling the treatment effect as a function of the covariate. So it's sort of this kind of hybrid thing where we're sort of sharing the data, but we're not sharing all of the, all of the individual data and in particular not all of the individual outcomes. But it's a way, again, to sort of fit, you can sort of explore whether the Kate models are similar or different across each study, uh, and then use that um, on the combined data. Finally, we're going to do um, a basic comparison with what kind of, I think, a default approach might be, where you've, especially if any of you are meta analysts, you might think, well, if we have individual patient data, uh, we would just com we you know combine all of those study data and then fit a meta analysis approach where we would allow for study random effects and and maybe study random slopes. Here we're doing sort of a basic one. So this is sort of a parametric analog where we are fit essentially a mixed effects model where we allow for some parameters to be shared across all of the studies and then some parameters to be study specific. Okay. Hopefully that makes some sense. I look forward to comments and a few, or questions in a bit. So first, you know, statistics talk, I'll give you um, some simulation results. So we did a, a fairly basic sort of small scale simulation. We're, we're currently working on um, larger ones that are more based on real data. Um, but for now, we just have a simple setting with um, five covariates. We have 10 trials here with 500 people in each. Um, and we are gonna have sort of a variety, three different true conditional average treatment effect models. One that is linear in the covariates, one that is nonlinear, and then one that is sort of quite, quite varying in some sense and in a sort of non-parametric way across the different trials. So I'm just gonna like jump to the results and not kind of get into all the weeds of this, um, but this figure shows the results from this and you can see, so the different colors, the different circles are these different approaches for the single study approaches. And then across the kind of columns of this figure are the different ways of combining across the studies. So 
first point is that you can see that in general, the red, green, and blue dots are broadly similar to each other, um, that in some, in some ways exactly which method we use within a data set doesn't matter a huge amount, although the causal forest approach does in general tend to provide the smallest mean square error. So um, as you'll see in the applied example, we'll move forward with the causal forest because it does seem to have better performance. Um, I should say this is averaging across all of our scenarios and iterations, so kind of sweeping under the rug the differences in like the linear or nonlinear sort of um, what the actual true models are. This is just sort of across across all of the settings. So point one is again that causal forest seems to have slightly better performance, but the S learner and X learner approaches were generally similar. Um, not surprising, the complete pooling of where we just throw our data together and sort of forget the fact that it comes from multiple studies. Um, doesn't give good performance because there is study heterogeneity. And so um, just ignoring that doesn't help, doesn't give us good um, estimates. Sorry, I should say this mean square error is, and then, sorry, again, second time giving this talk. The mean square error is the, um, essentially the difference between the estimated conditional average effect and the true conditional average effect for each person squared and averaged across people. So it's sort of a difference in how good we are at predicting individual treatment effects. Um, so then again, looking at sort of the columns, you can see not huge difference in how, you know, as long as we're accounting for trials somehow, whether that's through just a basic trial indicator or some of these fancier methods, um, they generally work pretty well. The ensemble forest using that sort of federated learning approach maybe is slightly better, but in general, it's, um, they're not dramatically different. Um, and I just want to comment on the meta-analysis on the right. Um, that looks like a reasonable performer sort of in the middle of, of many of the others. One catch there, um, and again, it's hidden in this figure, is that not surprisingly, the meta-analysis works very well and in fact is unbiased when the model that we are fitting with this, when this like linear model actually is the true model, but it is very poorly performing when we have the nonlinear models underlying it. So that is a little bit misleading in that sort of it can be performing very, very well sometimes, but very, very poorly. And sort of on average, it looks okay here, um, but it, there's a lot sort of underneath that. So again, sort of um, additional takeaways. Um, essentially, there's a little bit of sort of variation um, in sort of how things work I'll just quickly summarize uh, in the interest of getting to the example and then um, broader discussion is that the causal forest does sort of consistently seem to be the best performing um, and that the ensemble forest or just the basic kind of pool but keep a trial indicator in um, are the best sort of aggregate approaches. So let's um, think about what this looks like in the real, uh, look at what it looks like in the real data and then also some implications for practice and um, broader use of these methods. So um, again, given partly given the simulation results, we move forward with using that causal forest um, approach and then pooling with this trial indicator approach. So here is um, just across the like 1600 people in our study, when we pool, um, just kind of across all four trials, here is um, the dots, the black dots are the predicted conditional average treatment effects. So this is basically, if we take those, we're saying the average effect ranges from like, or sort of the, the kind of conditional effect, conditional on covariates ranges from about negative 10 to 10. So some variability centered slightly above zero. Uh, you can't really tell that here, but sort of it is centered slightly around zero. But I really want to highlight these huge confidence intervals. So you can see that for any individual person, our uncertainty in that conditional average treatment effect um, is huge. And you know, going from negative 20 to 10 or from negative 10 to 20. So um, a lot of uncertainty in these individual Kate estimates. It's also then, um, I didn't sort of fully say this, but the, this Kate that we're fitting is basically a function of these covariates that were back on this table. So we're sort of saying, does the treatment effect vary across these characteristics and potentially combinations of these characteristics? But it, you know, for sort of clinical practice and for kind of 
interpretation, this is not super useful because it's like, okay, fine, maybe there's some variability in these huge variants, but like, how do we use that to guide any sort of practice or additional research? So then often what people will do is what's called an interpretation tree. So it's basically um, like a cart tree using the Kate estimate. So we're basically seeing what factors, what covariates are sort of driving those, that variation in the Kate estimates. And here um, we can see, and you know, if you look at the variables at the top, age is the first one, um, a little bit on weight, some on this baseline depression rating scale. But still a little hard to sort of think through, well, okay, maybe we could think about like treatment decisions based on age and then weight and then this or that, but it's still a little bit hard to really think about how to use this in practice. And given the huge intervals here, you know, how meaningful is this? So we can also do things like, okay, well, let's now just look at age. So age came up as the most important moderator. So let's now look, let's just look at those Kate estimates as a function of age. Um, and so this doesn't show the variability in those, the uncertainty in those Kates, but it just shows across these age ranges, um, you know, is there a difference in effects? Maybe there's a little bit of signal. If you fit a lowest curve here, you know, there's a little bit of um, a signal of larger effects for older ages. But again, there's a lot of uncertainty um, and uh, sort of not a lot of, not a lot of signal in the noise. I will just quickly note, you might be wondering those sort of red um, lines essentially. So this is again, one of the challenges that comes up when combining data. That first trial, um, the red trial, only coded age based in age bands. So it was like 25 to 35, 35 to 45. So we've sort of coded everyone as just being at that, the middle of their band. But this is a limitation where we don't actually have sort of true individual ages um, for that particular study. Again, we can also then sort of look bivariately to see, okay, well, you know, do we see signals that uh, the effects vary across age and BMI, let's say, or, or weight? Um, and so we can sort of look and see, okay, do we see bigger cates? Um, but again, I would I view this very much as sort of exploratory, where we're kind of just sort of using these Kate models to kind of get a sense for sort of is there underlying heterogeneity and effects. And honestly, here and in all the other data sets I've used these methods in recently, um, it's I think a lot of a lot of noise and not a lot of signal. So let me now just um, take a few minutes to kind of provide some of that bigger picture thinking and also kind of give a signal for where we're taking this work um, and to potentially bring in the EHR. So I think, you know, one of the, and this is where I, I love this audience with sort of a mix of methodologists and, and applied um, potential users of these results and methods is sort of what do we do with this? Like, let's say we find that we can model the Kate as a function of, you know, a complex function of covariates but how do we interpret them? How do we summarize and illustrate them? You know, if in the end, we're gonna wanna go back to something where we look at age as an effect moderator, is there value in going sort of through this whole big fancy Kate or should we just start out by saying, we're, we're gonna look at age as a moderator and go back to basic subgroup analyses? Um, or maybe we do this whole process in the sort of exploratory hypothesis generating way as a way to then say, okay, now let's go back and focus on age because that seems like the thing that is most relevant. Um, so it's sort of that kind of like, what, where do we go from here? Um, again, there's huge uncertainty in these Kate estimates. You saw those error bands on that graph. So how do we make sure that any of our conclusions and, and additional analyses account for that uncertainty? One of the other things, this is a bit of a nuance, and this is actually what Carly, my student Carly is working on right now, is that in reality also, um, this is a little bit subtle, but, and I wasn't explicit, or I was explicit, but didn't highlight it. We are estimating effects here, sort of conditional on the sample we have and sort of conditional on someone being in a particular study. But of course, for future use, really we wanna be thinking about like a hypothetical patient who is coming in, they're not in one of these studies. They come from maybe sort of a, just a general population, kind of a, maybe we could think of a distribution of 
quote, studies. So how do we predict effects sort of for them, which brings in additional uncertainty? So we're working now on sort of things more like a random effects kind of approach where we kind of have, we get draws from the random effects for study uh, to account for that. Um, and then this is my, this is my like, you know, again, I've been trying this out in a few different data sets uh, in substance use treatment and, and mental health. And it's really, you know, even when we have fairly large samples, um, often, you know, it's hard to know, like, if this is actually meaningful. Um, so maybe these are just applications where there is not meaningful effect heterogeneity. And, and maybe that's good for clinical practice. Like if, you know, it, it's easier in some ways, if it's like, no, this, this is generally effective and we don't have to worry about sort of which person should get which medication. Um, but yeah, that's just sort of a, a kind of something in the back of my head. Maybe some of you have applied areas where there is sort of more kind of actual effect heterogeneity. I would love to um, explore these methods in those sorts of contexts too. And then again, you know, I, I drew you all in with the title about electronic health record data, but then I didn't talk about it. And again, this is partly because, you know, in reality, trying to do this is um, challenging. So we are chugging away. Um, but the EHR data, and any of you who've worked with it will know, it's different populations. The Duke and Hopkins data or you know, health systems are different. So we're trying to just make sure we understand them. Um, we have the confounding. We have challenges in even how to define the cohort because people, of course, in the US very much, they come in and out of a health system. So they might be in the Hopkins health system and we see them for a couple months, but then you know, they go to the University of Maryland across town. Um, and so we don't necessarily have sort of consistent data on a consistent population. Um, we also, really importantly for mental health, um, which makes it really challenging, is that there's different outcomes. So the trials focus on de um, like depression scales and symptom measures. We don't have those in the electronic health record systems, at least in the US. Um, some are just barely starting to collect some very basic, like the, what's called the PHQ-2 or the PHQ-9. But this Madras score, which is the kind of standard depression rating scale, is just not available in the EHR data. So in the EHR data, we have things like inpatient hospitalizations or um, emergency department visits or changes to medications. Um, but we have this challenge where we're going to have different outcomes in the trials and the EHR data. Um, so we're actually going to be working on extending these methods to be able to have different outcomes across those different sources. So all of this is very much a work in progress. So just, you know, in terms of conclusions, I think in these sort of relatively kind of clean, just using these trials, um, the pooling with trial indicator and ensemble forest worked pretty well. And the causal forest in particular was a good approach to use within each study. Um, parametric approaches like the random effects model we used um, did struggle when the true model was quite, was nonlinear. So I think um, it will be interesting to sort of continue to develop diagnostics to help people make decisions on how to, which methods to use in their particular data. Um, again, I will just remind that this is, we're sort of just beginning this work. So there's a lot more directions that it can be taken. Um, and I've alluded to some of that. Um, so like lots of more methods work to do um, and hopefully more papers. Um, I think I, I did see in the chat a question about the papers. So this is these are just some of the um, so the first and third and fourth bullets are other people's work of sort of just introductions to um, some of these approaches for estimating conditional average treatment effects and um, somewhat in combining data sources. The second bullet is a literature review on methods for integrating data um, that is on archive and, and coming out in statistical science, a special issue. Um, the simulation and applied example I presented today is a paper currently under review, not yet on archive, but actually might be in the next week or two. So um, check back or email me and we might be able to share it um, relatively soon. So um, I hope that was helpful and give you an introduction and I really look forward to the discussion. Thanks so much.